week. I hope you had a great week studying. We've got some fantastic questions to go with and we'll get right into it. Some of the questions are from the previous session. Some of the questions are from uh, the current session. So we'll cover them all today. Our first uh, set of questions here comes from Paul and Paul asks about segregated witness. Paul says, with SegWit, the signature data has been removed from the Bitcoin block and shifted to another extended block. Is this extended block on a sidechain? If you run a full Bitcoin client software, do you need this extended block information? And why do we need to store this signature information at all once the transaction has been validated and written to the blockchain? Uh, all good questions. Let's start with a very important clarification because this comes up again and again in terms of questions and it's an often misunderstood topic. With segregated witness, the signatures have not been moved from the Bitcoin blocks. They are in the Bitcoin blocks. They have been moved outside of the part of the transaction that is hashed in order to produce the transaction ID, which as a result protects against transaction malleability. They have been moved outside of the part of the transaction that gets hashed, but they have not been moved outside of the block. Instead, they are part of a Merkle tree called the Witness Merkle tree. and The root of that Merkle tree is stored in the Coinbase transaction of a Bitcoin block. So, signatures are recorded in a Bitcoin block. and When a Bitcoin block is mined, the signatures that are recorded in the Witness Merkle tree in the Coinbase transaction are also recorded to the blockchain and effectively locked forever, just like the transactions themselves. This ensures that not only is the transaction immutable, but all of the signature data is also immutable and also can be found in the same block as the transaction. What has changed is that the signature has simply been moved out of the part of the transaction where it gets hashed to produce a transaction ID. So it's not a sidechain and it's not an extended block either. Those terms mean different things. A sidechain is a completely different chain that is mined under different conditions with perhaps a different consensus algorithm. Um, and a sidechain is not linked directly to the Bitcoin blockchain. An extended block is another thing. It's a proposal for increasing uh, block size by uh, essentially creating additional block space outside of the block. And this has not been implemented in Bitcoin. So it, it's simply a term that's used in various proposals. And there's different varieties of extended blocks, but we do not currently use extended blocks in Bitcoin. And segregated witness is not an extended block system. Why do we need to store the signature data at all once it's been validated uh, and recorded on the blockchain? And this is a really interesting question. The reason we need it is because part of the philosophy of Bitcoin is that any client can bootstrap from the Genesis block, validate everything, and be able to arrive at the current state of the chain independently without trusting the miners. You see, the problem is if you don't have the signatures to validate what work the miners have done, that gives additional power to the miners because then you are trusting the miners to validate signatures for you, or you're trusting other nodes to validate signatures for you. And that means the different uh, attack scenarios become possible. That is not the way Bitcoin works. In Bitcoin, all participants, all nodes, validate all transactions and blocks, and a node can at any time start from the Genesis block and validate everything fully all the way to the current state of the chain independently without trusting any third party. Now, a lot of clients don't do that. They simply use um, either checkpoints. The last checkpoint was in 2014 to speed up their initial block download um, by not validating signatures before a certain point. But that's not necessary. You can always validate everything. And if I do a sync from an initial block download, I do a full validation sync. So you can do that, and it's an important principle in Bitcoin. All right, let me quickly check in the chat room, see how everyone's going. All 
And I'll go straight into the next question. Vincent asks a question about privacy coins. Vincent says, how would you explain the difference between Zcash and other privacy coins, such as Monero or Bitcoin? Is Dash a privacy coin as well? Um, okay, let's start with uh, um, Dash. Dash uh, is a privacy coin in that it uses a, a form of obfuscation in order to provide some degree of privacy. Um, a privacy coin is not the same as a strongly anonymous coin, and that's one of the fundamental differences. Bitcoin is one of the first uh, privacy coins. Uh, it's the granddaddy of privacy coins, and if I remember correctly, it was launched in 2014. Um, and many other privacy coins were built uh, as essentially a fork or. Um, as a uh, bootstrapped from uh, Bitcoin by uh, using some of the principles of the Bitcoin source code. Monero is one of those. So Monero is effectively a descendant, if you like, of uh, the Bitcoin software, uh, with significant changes since the initial uh, fork from Bitcoin or the initial. Uh, um, Introduction from Bitcoin. Uh, it didn't fork the chain of Bitcoin, but it used many of the same principles and source code in the beginning. Monero has since developed uh, many new technologies in privacy. So Monero and Bitcoin all share some basic structures, and uh, the primary mechanism that they use to achieve privacy is a system called ring signatures. And with ring signatures, what you're doing is effectively a coin join that involves random participants from the blockchain who don't need to participate uh, who don't need to consent to participate. Effectively, um, think of it as a coin join, and this is the way I think of it. To make more sense of it. Think of it as a coin join where you can pick a, a random set of UTXO on the blockchain and mix them into your transaction without the other uh, people having to participate in that coin join. And you can't tell are they really part of it or not. Um, you're basically mixing all of the coins all of the time, or a random subset of them. And this is much stronger than a coin join where the participants have to all get together in order to do this collaboratively, uh, which has a number of challenges for maintaining anonymity and privacy. So Monero and Bitcoin have much stronger privacy than that which is offered in coin join uh, because they use ring signatures. Zcash uses a completely different mechanism called a zero knowledge proof, um, and it uses a particular subset of that called a zk snark. Um, and so, what Zcash does is it uses a zero knowledge proof to prove that uh, coins that are being uh, spent are valid without revealing the source, the destination, or the amount. So it is much much stronger. So I would categorize Zcash as a strong anonymity coin rather than a privacy coin, because um, if it's used correctly and it works correctly, it provides complete uh, anonymity of transactions. Now, keep in mind, Zcash has two types of addresses, shielded addresses uh, and non-shielded addresses. And non-shielded addresses um, are completely transparent. Uh, so effectively, you can see the UTXO uh, just like you can with Bitcoin. They're still pseudonymous because you don't know who owns that address unless they've touched a system that reveals their identity, just like Bitcoin. So if you use Zcash with unshielded addresses only, you get no anonymity. Uh, you get weak pseudonymity, just like Bitcoin. And in fact, when Zcash is traded on exchanges, for example, they only use unshielded addresses. So the anonymity set there is completely broken. Um, if you want to use Zcash to get anonymity, you have to use shielded addresses. And once you move from unshielded addresses to shielded addresses, from that point on, your transaction cannot be tracked, your money cannot be tracked, and your activities cannot be tracked anymore. However, um, 
because you may have revealed identity information, for example, by buying Zcash coins on an exchange to an unshielded address, at least the fact that you bought uh, Zcash coins uh, is known and related to your address. And then at some point that becomes invisible as it goes into a shielded address, but you've already lost a significant degree of uh, privacy because someone knows that you went out and bought uh, these uh, Zcash coins. So those are some of the subtle differences between different types of privacy coins. Very good. The next question comes from Vincent and is about simplified payment verification proofs in sidechains. Vincent asks, I would like to understand better how they work. Who are the verifiers and what is the special output mentioned in slide 21? Are the verifiers the miners? Are SPV proofs only used in the two-way peg model? On page 21, just for reference, um, the text reads, the technical basis of sidechains is a two-way peg whereby Bitcoin can be transferred between any chain, parent and sidechains, at a deterministic or fixed rate. That's an exchange rate. In addition, SPV proofs play a vital role in sidechains. SPV proofs allow verifiers to check that some amount of work has been committed to the existence of a special output and to determine history by trusting that the longest blockchain is the correct longest blockchain. So, to answer uh, Vincent's question, what are the SPV proofs and how are they used in this particular scenario? What an SPV proof is effectively is demonstrating that a transaction output that is unspent uh, was created in a specific block in the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, um, by relating it to the Merkle root of transactions. So a block has within it a Merkle root for transactions, and that Merkle root um, can um, that Merkle root has been committed in the block and is part of the block hash and therefore is immutable. And that Merkle root depends on all of the transactions that are in the Merkle tree. So you can prove that a transaction is inside a specific block uh, with a very simple and, um, and short proof where you relate it to the Merkle root by showing a Merkle path. A Merkle path is um, a series of hashes that show the other side of the tree so that you can reconstruct all the way up to the Merkle root. So you say, well, here's the transaction ID. Here's the hash it was hashed with to produce its parent. Here's the hash that parent was hashed with to produce its parent. Here's the hash that parent was hashed with to produce its parent all the way up to the Merkle root. Now, if you have, for example, a thousand or two thousand transactions in um, in the tree, you can do that proof with um, with just uh, ten uh, with just ten hashes. You can produce a Merkle path to the top. Uh, so that gives you a, a very short proof with just uh, ten two hundred and fifty six bit hashes that sh allows you to demonstrate the existence of any one of two thousand transactions in a specific block. Combined with showing the proof of work and the block header, um, you can actually demonstrate that that block had um, an enormous amount of mining behind it uh, when it was recorded, and uh, that serves as proof that that block was actually mined on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, this is not as strong a proof as being able to verify the entire chain all the way up to. Um, that particular block and verify the UTXO itself and also verify that that UTXO has not been spent. But it is, a, it is a simplified payment verification, which is why they call it SPV. So SPV proofs are verified by the miners who are verifying the sidechain. Um, and the consensus algorithm can be different. In some cases, the verifiers are a federated group, such as, for example, on the liquid uh, sidechain, where the verifiers are a federation who participates in a multi-sig, and the SPV proofs are verified by this federation. In other examples, you might have a sidechain that uses proof of work or proof of stake or some other 
uh, consensus model. So it depends entirely on the consensus model of the sidechain. Remember, when you have a sidechain, its security is only as strong as its consensus mechanism. And the, if it's a sidechain to the Bitcoin blockchain, its security will be different from the proof of work security that is provided in the Bitcoin blockchain. So when you're looking at the security of sidechains, you have to consider the consensus model and level of security that the sidechain offers, as well as the level of security that the primary chain offers. And any chain can be a sidechain to any other chain, um, effectively. Peggy Johnson asks, are there real challenges between blockchains and hash graphs? Is it possible that a hash graph could become a better option? Um, is there a real competition here? Well, these are fundamentally different ways of recording and reconciling the ledger of transactions um, within a system. And, um, hash graphs work very differently from uh, blockchains. But at the end of the day, a lot of this has to do not with the mechanism by which the information is recorded and how you keep the state of the ledger, but also what consensus algorithm you use. So you could use a hash graph uh, with a proof of work consensus algorithm. You could use a hash graph uh, with a proof of stake consensus algorithm, or some kind of hybrid in uh, in between. Um, as far as I know, and I may be wrong about this. So. Um, but that's my understanding. Similarly, you can have a blockchain with proof of work or proof of stake or delegated proof of stake or some kind of hybrid between the two or proof of authority or federated um, proof of uh, consensus mechanism. So all of these different uh, technologies um, can be differentiated by the consensus algorithm they, they use. Depending on the particular combination of consensus algorithm and how you store the state um, of the ledger, um, you can have different effects which are more suitable for different types of applications. For example, um, while Ethereum is a blockchain, it uses an account-based rather than a UTXO state machine-based uh, ledger, which is a very, very different uh, mechanism than the one that Bitcoin uses, and that gives it very different characteristics. It's not as robust in terms of um, controlling the state uh, of the ledger as Bitcoin is, but it's much more flexible for the use of smart contracts. So that's a trade-off that happened there. Um, so a hash graph provides different trade-offs as well from a blockchain, and you've got to consider how these trade-offs apply to different applications. Whether these two distributed ledger technologies are competing directly against each other um, can be answered more importantly by asking for which specific application. This is not simply a space where every single type of distributed ledger technology can do every single possible application, and they're all competing for a single spot that wins everything. I don't believe that. I believe that each blockchain or each distributed ledger technology has decided to make certain design trade-offs, and then the market finds a market fit for specific application use cases for that set of trade-offs that exist in that blockchain. So, does a hash graph compete against a blockchain? It depends on the application. So far, um, for the application of robust, uh, censorship-resistant, borderless, neutral money in the form of Bitcoin, uh, nothing else has been able to compete effectively. Um, in that particular application case, but that's not the only application space, and not everything is competing for that application space. So a hash graph may compete for a completely different application space with a completely different set of trade-offs. This is not a winner-takes-all, in my opinion. This is not a zero-sum game. Uh, I look at it more as an evolutionary space with different environmental niches, which are the applications, into which different species of distributed ledger technology can find an appropriate fit and, and become very effective, even dominant in that particular niche. Uh, but once they do, they are no longer competing for other niches that may be adjacent.
All right, um, our next topic actually is going to be discussed in more detail in um, week eight, uh, which is two weeks from now. We're currently in session six of the course, but it's drawn a lot of attention and comments in the chat and on the forums. So it's a hot topic right now. So I'm going to cover it a bit. And this topic is central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. What could be the challenges to central bank digital currencies? Um, first a comment comes from Lewis and Lewis says, according to a January 2019 report titled Central Banks and Distributed Ledger Technology, at least 40 central banks around the world are currently or soon will be researching and experimenting with central bank digital currency. What do you think are the challenges for this initiative? This is a great question and there are a number of um, answers in the forum that are rather interesting. So let's go and look at some of those answers. Dietmar says, whatever central bank is going to do, it won't be decentralized or censor persistent. Central banks are out of control. They don't want anything that they cannot control. It's a completely different pair of shoes. Uh, that's a great expression. Nadine says, I think tether coins are a forerunner example and those are all basically centralized. And Lewis responds, thank you Nadine and Dietmar. However, many countries are researching distributed ledger technologies for this to create a digital currency and maybe it needs some adjustments. So let's talk a bit more about this topic of central bank digital currencies. So first of all, um, the vast majority of currencies in the world are digital currencies. The US dollar, the euro, yen are primarily digital currencies. Why do I say that? Because in most cases, the amount of money that is in circulation in physical form, that means notes, paper notes, bank notes, coins, um, that are in circulation in the economy is usually less than 10% of the overall amount of money that is being used in the economy. So less than 10, 10% is physical and 90% of it is digital. So aren't fiat currencies already digital? They are already digital. If 90% of your currency is digital, then it's a digital currency. Um, the difference is that the current technology that these digital currencies use is databases. So uh, currently digital currencies use databases. Uh, you could, might call them if you like, instead of blockchain currencies, you could call them SQL currencies, SQL currencies. Because the digital currencies that we use today, such as dollars, euros, yen, uh, whatever are actually stored in the databases of both central banks and uh, various other regional investments and retail banks that keep account ledgers of their customers' deposits, um, and those account ledgers are stored in databases. Uh, they may be different kinds of databases. They may use a variety of different underlying technologies, but effectively they're all some form of relational database, which is absolutely centralized. Uh, they may be replicated in multiple places for backup purposes. They may be audited by a number of different organizations, but fundamentally they are databases. Now these databases store the account value. If you have a checking account in a bank, that's not physical notes and coins, of course. Banks only have a small percentage of their total accounts available as cash withdrawals at any mo moment in time. It's a number in a database. If you have an investment account or a retirement account, it's a number in a database. So what are we talking about here when we talk about central bank digital currencies? Well, primarily we're talking about marketing. Uh, this is about changing the conversation because fundamentally these are already digital currencies. And what we're talking about is a technology refresh. A technology refresh whereby we replace uh, relational databases or what's being suggested is replacing relational databases with distributed ledger technology. The architecture of this distributed ledger technology will still be centralized. It may be less centralized than the relational databases they're using today, but it will still be centralized. So what does that mean? 
It means that you might have a federated consortium of multiple banks. You might have a number of uh, central bank uh, districts or groups. For example, uh, many central banks have uh, regional central banks. Here in the U.S., um, there are a number of central banks around the country that come together to make the Federal Reserve System. And uh, so there's the New York Fed, there's the Dallas Fed, etc., etc. So all of these different Federal Reserve uh, branches could be part of some kind of multi-sig federation or uh, some other proof of consensus, proof of authority type distributed ledger technology. So is it centralized? Well, in effect, it's a bit less centralized than the current mechanism, where each party controls their own relational database. Uh, but in terms of the actual application of control, it's still centralized. Um, these central bank digital currencies will not be able to be open, public, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, and immutable. So let's let's look at these characteristics. I've often repeated these characteristics as the foundational pillars, if you like, of an open public blockchain, and what makes things like Bitcoin special. Open means that anyone can participate without authorization, without vetting, without asking for permission, simply by downloading the appropriate software or writing the appropriate software in compliance with the rules and APIs. This is something you can do in Bitcoin. You don't need anyone's permission to bootstrap a node with any software you want, as long as it follows the consensus rules. Um, open also means that anyone can initiate a transaction from anywhere in the system. Again, that's something that happens with uh, Bitcoin and other open public uh, cryptocurrencies. Open is something that cannot, will not ever happen with central bank digital currencies. The reason that it cannot ever happen is because ultimately central banks need to control the participants of every transaction. It would violate every law we have today to do that with a central authority through a central bank. Every participant in these transactions will be vetted, and it will be unlikely that you, as a consumer, will be able to initiate a transaction in the ledgers of the central bank digital currency. That's something that likely only banks will be able to do. And that means that the accounts that you have that represent this currency are going to be custodial accounts held by banks that have the rights to do this. How is this different from SWIFT? It's not really that different. Um, again, it's really a technology change rather than an architecture or control change. Borderless. These systems will not be borderless. Bitcoin and other open public uh, cryptocurrencies are completely borderless. They operate everywhere in the world that you can get any kind of communication medium. Satellite, wireless, radio, internet, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as you can transmit and receive information somehow, um, and connect to uh, at least one more node that is part of the network, you can operate regardless of physical, political, geographic borders. And therefore, um, Open public blockchains are borderless. Central bank digital currencies will not be borderless. They will be strictly restricted within the jurisdiction of a country. Uh, they may have bridges or gateways between countries, just like SWIFT has today, but they won't be borderless. Neutral. Uh, neutral means that um, transactions are propagated regardless of the send recipient or purpose of the transaction, and nobody gets to uh, question who you are, where you're sending, why you're sending, and what you're using your money for. And open public blockchains are neutral in that way, just like net neutrality on the internet. The idea being that content is transmitted from one address to another um, on the internet, and uh, currency is transmitted from one address to the other on an open public blockchain, and you don't get you don't have to tell what you're paying, why you're paying, who you're paying, or who you are. Um, of course, central bank digital currencies will not be neutral. Um, they have to apply know your customer anti-money laundering and verification policies to make sure that you don't use currency for purposes that are not approved by the current political regime or legal system of the country in which you reside, which is also one of the reasons they can't be borderless, because they have to have a legal framework for that. And they will be censorship resistant because of course some transaction types will not be allowed. 
uh, you will have a situation where if you do a transaction with someone who is on a blacklist or you do a transaction for a purpose not permitted, uh, for example, um, funding a political dissent in Hong Kong uh, or uh, in North Korea, that transaction will not be allowed by the central bank digital currency. And therefore, central bank digital currencies cannot be censorship resistant. In fact, they will be heavily centered um, and they can't be neutral. They also can't be immutable. Uh, and immutable is a characteristic that really uh, derives from many of the others, but um, of course they can't be immutable because for the same reasons they can't be neutral and censure persistent. If for whatever reason a transaction gets through that is illegal, uh, the central bank digital currency will be able to reverse that transaction, to undo uh, that transaction, to block, freeze, seize and reverse transactions. Of course they will, just as they can in the current banking system. And Therefore, central bank digital currencies will not be immutable. So they're not open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, um, or immutable. They're unlikely to be publicly auditable and verifiable, which means you will not be able to audit them because that would open um, every transaction to the scrutiny of everyone in the public. And we all know that uh, governments love secrecy um, as much as they hate our privacy. So while all of us will be heavily surveilled if we use a system like this, and we're talking about totalitarian financial surveillance, fascism of finance effectively, um, your government won't be monitored by you. Um, that's not going to happen. So of course they won't be publicly auditable. Um, and all of these are characteristics of open public cryptocurrencies. So do central bank digital currencies compete with open public cryptocurrencies? They don't. They don't because they fulfill a completely different purpose. And we've seen some of the same kind of concerns emerge with Libra and corporate cryptocurrencies or corporate digital currencies. Uh, from the moment that white paper was written, people immediately started looking at how this would compete with the other things that are available. And effectively, for all of the same reasons, corporate digital currencies cannot be any of the characteristics we have for open public cryptocurrencies. And therefore, what we're looking at is essentially a three-way competition for three different domains of use cases and applications. There's money of the people, by the people, and for the people that is open public cryptocurrencies that give freedom, independence, financial empowerment, sovereignty, uh, and the ability for anyone to use them anywhere in the world, anytime they want, for any purpose they want. And that's open public cryptocurrencies. There are corporate currencies that will be um, used to collect privacy information from you in order to sell it to advertisers and provide corporate surveillance, just like Facebook and other companies already do, but now they'll do it on all of your money too. And then there will be government currencies, and government currencies will be um, basically very little different from what they are today. Um, perhaps slightly more decentralized than they were before, slightly less subject to the kinds of extreme corruption and a lack of transparency than they were before, and perhaps a slight upgrade in the technology infrastructure. But architecturally, in terms of who has control and who has the power in the system, they'll be exactly the same as today's fiat currencies, and therefore they cannot serve any of the purposes that open public cryptocurrencies serve. So there we go. That's uh, central bank digital currencies. We will be revisiting that topic in uh, session eight. A quick check in the chat room. Let's see how things are going. I'm going to take a quick drink. And we'll move straight into the next topic of today, which is smart contracts. Susan asks, when developing a smart contract, the tokens are sent either to a wallet address or to a contract address. Are these tokens mined? And if not, how are they included in the blockchain? Um, Susan, that's a, a great question. Uh, as you know, in a, in a smart contract environment, such as uh, a uh, virtual machine based uh, blockchain like Ethereum uh, and many others that have similar functionality, 
there are really two types of addresses in the system, for the most part. Although in the future we may see that distinction being blurred. Wallets are what are known as externally owned addresses, or EOAs, are addresses where private keys exist, and the private keys that control those um, addresses are outside the blockchain, of course, just as they are in Bitcoin. So, um, if you think about it, in, in, in Bitcoin, all addresses are externally owned addresses because the private keys are controlled outside of the blockchain and used to sign transactions um, that are recorded on the blockchain. The private keys are never on the blockchain. With a contract, there is no private key. The address represents the contract, and the decision of how the funds are used, spent, or what the rules are, are defined in the contract in the programming language that is used in the smart contract environment. So, for example, in Ethereum, that would be um, the EVM bytecode uh, compiled from Solidity as one example. So, the contract has code that determines what happens to the money, whereas an external owned address has private keys that control what happens to the money. But other than that, the tokens that are being transmitted are minted or mined in very similar ways. The consensus algorithm may be different, the monetary policy may be different, but those tokens are created at some point separate from that. So for example, if you're talking about the native cryptocurrency that operates on the smart contract environment. So for example, in the case of Ethereum, the native cryptocurrency is Ether, which is used to pay for gas uh, and also to make monetary payments, then Ether is minted as part of block mining that occurs every 15 to 30, 30 seconds on average um, on the Ethereum blockchain. So every time a new block is created uh, in Ethereum, it contains an amount of Ether as part of its coinbase that is awarded to the miner um, under the current system with proof of work, but in the future it could be to the staker under a system of proof of stake. So again, coins are created with every block and they're part of the reward system that is used to run the consensus algorithm and to provide security for the blockchain. And those coins are then used for uh, transmitting from address to address in an externally owned address to an externally owned address or from externally owned address to a contract, or from a contract to an externally owned address, or from a contract to a contract. All transactions start um, with an externally owned address that initiates a transaction to launch a contract, but then a contract may invoke another contract that may invoke another contract, etc. Those coins have been mined. Uh, on the blockchain. Now, if you're looking at tokens such as um, ERC20 tokens or ERC720 uh, tokens, or if I remember correctly, I might be wrong. Um, if you look at either fungible or non-fungible tokens um, or other forms of tokens, there are probably uh, a dozen different token specifications uh, just on Ethereum today, and many, many more on other blockchains. How exactly they're mined uh, depends on the implementation of the contract that introduces these tokens. So tokens that are built on top of a token, a smart contract platform, are built with smart contracts. And those smart contracts define the rules by which the tokens are produced. In some case, all of the tokens are mined uh, the moment the contract is recorded on the blockchain and may be uh, allocated to a specific externally owned address or they're allocated to a contract that then doles them out uh, in some kind of fashion or they're allocated and sold in an auction. There could be a number of different ways that they get into the hands of users, uh, but effectively in many cases they're mined at the time of contract creation, or the contract determines an issuance schedule by which it will release a number of uh, tokens over time, um, triggered by different transactions or events on the smart contract environment. So when you get into tokens, it gets more complicated because every token can have its own monetary policy and its own minting conditions and schedule. Uh, it can have um, uh, some kind of sale that's happening, a crowd sale, an ICO, an auction um, of any kind, and you can specify all of that 
by using a different smart contract or writing a new smart contract to implement a different policy. So you can't really say um, how tokens are being minted unless you speak about a specific token, specific version, and the specific contract that is minting it. Now you may notice I'm using the term minting instead of mining, and that's because mining itself usually refers to proof of work consensus algorithms, and it's it's sometimes difficult because the two terms get confused. So the issuance of currency, which happens as a reward in Bitcoin, is mining of new coins because the proof of work algorithm. Uh, the algorithm for consensus is proof of work, so mining is what drives that particular blockchain, and therefore the issuance or minting of new coins happens because of mining. But in a proof of stake um, mechanism, minting happens because of staking. Again, it's a reward mechanism for ensuring the security of the network, and it may happen every block again, uh, but that may differ from blockchain to blockchain. But it's not really mining because there's no proof of work algorithm. Um, so coins are issued or minted uh, through a different consensus algorithm. Uh, so that's why the the terms are a bit confusing there. Uh, it's important to separate the concept of mining as a proof of work algorithm or consensus algorithm that is ensuring the security of the network, and that's its primary purpose. From the side effect of minting or issuance of new currency, which is a reward mechanism for the security. Mining's purpose is not to create new coins. Mining's purpose is to secure the network, and mining continues after new coins are done minting. In the example of for the monetary supply of Bitcoin, as we'll see in the following question, the the bottom line is that mining is for securing. The side effect is the issuance of new um, coins, and you can use a completely different mechanism for securing the network and still have. Uh, issuance of new coins as a side effect, or you could have the issuance of new coins completely disconnected from the security mechanism of the blockchain. Although uh, then you have some significant problems as to how exactly you incentivize the security mechanism, uh, which uh, doesn't have some kind of reward tied to it. Another comment that is being discussed next week in week seven uh, had a lot of comments in the chat, so we're going to talk about it a bit today. Which is smart contracts interacting with IoT or Internet of Things and AI or artificial intelligence. Lewis asks, could smart contracts interact with IoT or AI in order to bring smart solutions in the agriculture sector? And this is a really uh, common topic that comes up again and again. Lewis continues, in the agriculture sector, there is a key necessity to know the route followed of a crop from the field to the market. Do you think it's possible to build a solution that integrates blockchain, IoT, and AI to automate the traceability of agriculture products? What would be the challenges? The challenge, the fundamental challenge, is what's known as the Oracle problem. Uh, more generically, and in this particular case, it's about connecting a physical asset or commodity uh, to a, a virtual token that tracks it on a blockchain. So, what is the Oracle problem? The Oracle problem is that when you're operating in a smart contract environment, if you need to get information about things that are not part of the blockchain, but things that happen outside of the blockchain, for example, things that are happening in the real world, if you like, uh, things like weather effects or temperatures, tornadoes hitting for insurance purposes, or um, whether a mushroom that you have in the store is the same mushroom that you uh, pulled out of a dark, dank cave somewhere, um, and that that mushroom was tracked all the way to the store. That's an externality to the blockchain. Unlike tracking the provenance of a Bitcoin or uh, tracking the provenance of an Ether or another token 
on a smart contract platform whereby the token itself is in the blockchain and therefore all of the information about it is available to the smart contract. In the case of something like a mushroom that's sitting on a store shelf, how do you know the information about that mushroom? Well, you have to get input from a source outside of the blockchain. That input comes in the form of what's known as an oracle. And an oracle is essentially a gateway between a smart contract environment and the external world. The oracle gets information about something that happened in the external world and then provides that information to the smart contract through some kind of communication channel. And the Oracle problem is how do you trust the Oracle? Of course, if you trust the Oracle, then that becomes a single uh, trusted party. And then you have counterparty risk because if you can feed lies to the Oracle or if you can compromise the Oracle and have it feed lies to the smart contract, then the smart contract will act on information that is untrue and in many cases it will act in a way that is immutable by nature and cannot be reversed. And so then you have a very fundamental problem. In, uh, in the area of smart contracts, uh, we are seeing a lot of research in how to do decentralized oracles that use some kind of consensus mechanism to verify the information that the oracle collects and transmits to the uh, blockchain or smart contract so as to ensure that there isn't a single point of failure. Now you're dealing with the security of a different consensus algorithm than the one that's running on the blockchain, or maybe the same consensus algorithm, but again, how do you validate that information? It's very difficult to make statements about physical processes in the real world that you can uh, that you can accurately identify as correct. It's even more difficult where you're talking about something like a logistics or supply chain, which is why I'm very skeptical of applications of blockchains in the logistics and supply chain domain, uh, such as agriculture at the current time. It's one thing to say there's a football game and we can have a hundred thousand people certify with penalty through proof of stake that the outcome of the game between this team and that team was that the first team won. Because you can do that in a very decentralized manner, but you can't get a hundred thousand people to put stake down to prove that this mushroom on the shelf is the same mushroom that came out of the cave. So that's a fundamental problem because you have a much more narrow pipeline with much more narrow information. Now you could use Internet of Things sensors essentially to track various physical objects as they move through the supply chain. But the problem then is that you're trusting the sensor, you're trusting the placement of that sensor, you're trusting trusting the things that read the sensor, you're trusting the communication channels between the, the sensor readings and the oracle, and then you're trusting the oracle. Unless you have lots of independently operated sensors, and then you have other problems. This is a very, very difficult problem to solve. I've done a talk specifically about that called Bananas on Blockchain, uh, which makes fun of the general idea that you can do this. Um, and a very simple example is something um, I read about a way that sensors have been compromised in the past, which is that in some industries, sensors are used to ensure that the temperature of an item being transported in a refrigerated truck does not exceed uh, a certain temperature, spoiling the goods. This is obviously done with vaccines and it's done with other things like that. Um, and um, the, the, the story, and I don't know if this is apocryphal but, or real, but I, I can't see why it's not a serious concern, is you have a refrigerated truck and it breaks down and it stops refrigerating and the driver pulls into a gas station, buys a bag of ice and then puts an ice cube on each one of the sensors, thereby ensuring that the sensors remain at the correct temperature. Meanwhile, all of the vaccines or whatever else you've got in those boxes um, spoils because they cannot maintain that temperature. So, you could go many different ways to ensure that all of the sensors are tamper-proof and blah, 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 blah. But there's always this fundamental problem of attacks against the communication channels you use, the, the sensors being tampered with, etc., etc. And all of this is out there in the physical world where the number of uncertainties is much, much higher. So I'm very skeptical about these applications, at least for now. That doesn't mean they'll never happen. 
That doesn't mean you can't apply these types of solutions in narrow domains where you have very, very strict tracking or where you have fungible commodities um, and you're not tracking individual things like mushrooms. Uh, for example, it's a lot easier to track that a certain amount of oil um, crude oil is loaded onto a tanker and then track on the other side with, with audited processors and multiple signatories that a same amount of crude oil came off a ship and record all of those information in a blockchain because oil is oil and it's fungible and it doesn't really matter if it's the same molecule of oil as the other one. Um, a lot harder to do with individualized objects. So, you know, the same thing applies to identity because effectively humans are non-fungible, um, non-fungible items, and and when you're trying to track identity on the blockchain, you have all of the same problems we just talked about. An identity blockchain is essentially a logistics blockchain for the non-fungible item of humans, and that becomes very, very tricky to verify um, that the information you get into the system is correct, that it can't be compromised, that you don't import lies, because those lies then become immutable lies, uh, or that no one in the chain can corrupt the information. Because of course, if you can corrupt the information, you can steal someone's identity. Just like if you can corrupt the supply chain information, you can steal products or replace them with inferior products or tainted products or out of date spoiled products whatever so all of these are challenges and of course there are massive financial incentives to compromise such systems this is not simply a matter of everyone's going to be good and honest um, you have to deal with the game theoretical situation where um, there are massive incentives to not be good and honest and the system has to be able to overcome those um, and to overcome them without reliance on a trusted authority to provide truth. Otherwise, what is the point of using a blockchain? You might as well use a database. It's much less cumbersome as a technology, and you can easily correct mistakes. If you can provide a robust process of audit and oversight that is sufficiently decentralized in order to uh, ensure that the truth is propagated all the way through the system, then why put a blockchain at the end of it? Why not just use a database and apply the same magical process that you've invented? Again, this is the fundamental problem with these scenarios. Vincent asks about colored coins versus ERC-20 coins. Regarding tokenized assets, why don't we hear much about colored coins today and why apparently has it been superseded by ERC-20 tokens? Is Ethereum better than Bitcoin for issuing tokenized assets? Yes, that's the simple answer. Ethereum is better than Bitcoin at issuing and tracking tokenized assets because it's much easier to do on Ethereum. The user interfaces, the APIs are much more comprehensive. The flexible uh, rate of development of Ethereum ensures that um, you have a lot more options available, the toolkits, the libraries, the number of developers who can implement this stuff, much easier to do um, on Ethereum. And of course, the market has fully validated this, propos this proposition. Uh, you know, if you ask the market, is Ethereum better at issuing tokens than Bitcoin? The answer is a resounding yes, because all of the tokens get issued on Ethereum or other um, virtual machine-based, smart contract-based platforms that are better for doing that. Um, is it as secure? No, it's not. But Again, this is a trade-off that makes sense in the case of, uh, of tokenized assets. Uh, it makes sense for a number of reasons, but where there is a trade-off for simplicity, ease of use, and convenience versus security, simplicity, ease of use, and convenience often wins. You can say that's not right, you can say that shouldn't be, but the market has already said that that's a better trade-off. So um, today, uh, Ethereum specifically, but other virtual machine smart contracts platforms have dominated the token environment uh, because they make it very easy to issue. Of course, that also means that the vast, vast majority of the tokens issued are related to scams with very little um, technical um, 
technical ability behind them, uh, very little novelty and are mostly money grabs. But that doesn't negate the fact that there are some very interesting applications with tokens being developed on these platforms too that may have an interesting future. And we're learning a hell of a lot more with tokens now that we see so many different efforts um, working in parallel with different experiments than we were before in the color coin way. So Bitcoin uh, certainly paved the way uh, for tokenization, but tokenization didn't really come into uh, its full fruition, uh, scams and all, uh, until uh, Ethereum provided a much more flexible platform for that. And the last question for today will be about transaction cancelability. Apostle says, we are being taught that once a transaction is submitted on the blockchain, it cannot be cancelled. Let's be very clear here. Submitted is not the right word. Once a transaction has sufficient confirmations on the blockchain, it cannot be reversed. Apostolos continues, I read somewhere that some wallets give you the opportunity to resend your transaction with a higher fee, hence a bigger incentive for the miners to uh, mine it fast in case it is stuck for a long time in the mempool. Does this, is this a means of cancellation of the previous transaction? Would it be possible to cancel a previous transaction in the mempool by submitting a new transaction with a higher fee? Yep. And for instance, if a subsequent transaction that gets to be collected and propagated faster than your previous transaction spends all your money, would it cancel the previous transaction due to insufficient funds? Yes, that's called a double spend. So here's what we're talking about here. Effectively, we're talking about the, the time between a transaction is transmitted to the blockchain in the mempool versus a transaction that is recorded on the blockchain, confirmed by the miners, by being mined into a block. Um, that's a critical distinction. So transactions being submitted in the mempool are basically being propagated, whereas transactions that are recorded on the blockchain by being mined are being settled or confirmed. So settlement is what makes a transaction final. Finalization or finality in a blockchain is achieved by this process of settlement. In uh, Bitcoin, the process of settlement or finality is a probabilistic process. That means that the more confirmations you have, the lower the probability that a transaction can be reversed. Theoretically, and only theoretically, you could reverse a transaction for the second block. Um, by remining the entire Bitcoin blockchain from the Genesis block forward and replacing the second block with a new second block. However, in practice it's impossible. And that difference between in theory and in practice is what we mean by saying probabilistically settled. So as time goes by and more confirmations are insured on a transaction or more blocks are mined on top of a transaction, the amount of work needed to reverse it increases uh, at a very rapid rate and um, it becomes practically impossible. Um, now, the amount at which it, the time at which it becomes practically impossible also depends on the amount. Obviously, um, if you have a billion dollar transaction that if reversed would gain a miner a significant amount, perhaps because they are double spending their own money, uh, then you have a billion dollar incentive to reverse it. It takes a lot more confirmations until the cost of mining blocks uh, adversarially against other miners and taking the risk in order to reverse a transaction. Well, obviously it takes a lot more blocks before you're certain that that transaction has settled. If you're talking about a $10 cup of coffee, uh, yes, that's how much they cost in Switzerland. Uh, if you're talking about a $10 coffee, obviously um, nobody's going to bother trying to reverse that by rewriting the blockchain through a massive 51% attack against the other miners. Um, so probabilistic confirmation is the key here. Now, in the window between transmission of a transaction and uh, confirmation on the blockchain, we call those transactions zero confirmation transactions, or better, unconfirmed transactions, because they haven't settled. They're sitting in the mempool. Now, is that transaction going to go through? Probably. 
Um, and it depends on the amount of fee. So, Wallets offer uh, a number of mechanisms to help you bump the fee. One of those mechanisms is called replace by fee. Another one is called child pays for parent. But effectively, these mechanisms are nothing more than ways to signal to the miners. Because the miners will already do this if you give them a bigger incentive. So you don't need a special mechanism. All you have to do is transmit a transaction with a bigger fee that consumes the same UTXO, that double spends the same UTXO. Now the double spend will never happen once a transaction is confirmed because that's what the Bitcoin blockchain does. That's what every blockchain does. Um, that's the problem it solves. It does not allow double spend after a transaction has been confirmed uh, with a certain probability. However, before a transaction is confirmed, you can present as many copies of that transaction you want, spending the same UTXO in different ways. You could spend to other outputs. And this is also a mechanism that has been used before to effectively take back a payment from a merchant. So uh, let's say you, you pay for a five dollar cup of coffee. This one's cheaper, you got it at Starbucks. And your five dollar cup of coffee, the transaction is not confirmed, but they give you your coffee. And as you're walking out, you use a special software which exists to double spend uh, that transaction. What you do is you spend the same inputs that you own but instead of sending it to Starbucks address, you send it to your change address or another address in your own wallet. And you put a bigger fee on it. And if you transmit that, the miners will mine it first. And if they mine it first, Starbucks will never get paid and you already drank the coffee, so they're out five dollars. Now in many cases for those kinds of transactions, it doesn't really matter because the convenience of being able to take a zero confirmation transaction and hope that it gets through and the effort required to double spend it, which isn't that much, but you do have to get some special software, isn't really worth it. Um, so uh, that's the same reason why in many uh, coffee shops they won't ask you for a signature. Um, or PIN for your credit card transaction, because yes, theoretically you could go back, dispute the transaction with your credit card and get your money back after you've already drank the coffee, but to the coffee shop it's not worth it. So, can you replace another transaction that's already been mined? Not unless the miners uh, reconverge the blockchain and invalidate the block it was mined in, which gets harder and harder even after one block. Um, can you replace a transaction before it's been mined? Yes, you can. There are mechanisms to make it easy for you to do that um, that are used for you to bump the fees. Uh, replaced by fee and child pays for parent, as well as uh, specialized wallets that allow you to basically bounce that transaction to a different address um, and double send it before it's confirmed so you can take the money back, which is stealing. So um, there are those possibilities. So a transaction that has not been finalized um, is reversible. That's the bottom line and will always be reversible. And with that, we've completed this session of the uh, sixth week of the massive open online course for the University of Nicosia's master's degree in digital currencies. I'm Andreas Antonopoulos, and I'll be answering your questions next week. Uh, please ask lots of great questions in the forum, just like the ones you asked today, and I will see you in a week time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.